Hey everyone, how's it going? We have a bit of a special video today. As many of you have, might know if you've been following my channel, I've stopped doing podcast episodes for some time and I've just been focusing on solo videos. But recently I got the opportunity to speak to Stephen Pope on an episode together and we will be diving into his Amazon selling journey because a lot of us know him for running my Amazon guy and doing all of these cool different things, the courses, the videos, the education on LinkedIn, but not many of us know the details of his Amazon seller journey. So in this episode, I'll be asking out the brands that he started, how he actually started with Amazon, what worked, what didn't work. And I think there will be a lot of value uncovered for sellers listening to this episode. So Stephen Pope, everyone already knows who you are, but if you can just give us a brief introduction, that would be good. Well, hey, thanks for having me on. And I, I love doing this because you always get to learn new things and share knowledge. And that's part of my personal mission in life. I want to level up life to bring prosperity to the world. And I want to do it in a way that I accelerate it. Right? So that's kind of my, my personal mission. Uh, but yeah, I've been selling on Amazon in various ways for 12, 13 years now. Uh, was on the corporate track, did retail arbitrage, done private label, started an agency six and a half years ago. I've known nothing but growth. Amazon has made me very wealthy uh, and I'm happy to share all my trade secrets today. So thanks for having me on. Perfect. Sounds good. Let's start with the backstory. Before we hit record, you explained that you started selling on Amazon a few years before my Amazon guy. And I don't know if you went yes. into this story before. So tell us the starter story, why you started on Amazon, how you began and maybe what products you were selling and why. So when I was working on the corporate track, I was a marketing manager. Before that, I was a TV reporter, but got out of the news industry. Um, and I've talked a little bit about that in the past. So I'll give you kind of the unique take where I talk about the corporate transition to side hustling and Amazon brand, because I haven't talked a lot about that. Um, but I, I worked for everything from women's plus size clothing, kitchen equipment, gold and silver coins, and and just like all kinds of random things, even lighting um, and, and a lot of other random products. And what I learned along the way is that it was just the fastest way to grow sales. Uh, the, the easiest way to do anything in e-commerce was Amazon. And I fell in love with the platform and I was working for the gold and silver company called Atmex. It's a billion dollar company with a 3% margin. Uh, so kind of, it's more like a $50 million company if you get the drift. Uh, but they were the number one seller on eBay. And uh, I, I was just fascinated by what they did. And, and I tried to convince them to sell on Amazon, but Amazon wouldn't like fix the referral fee issue. And, and it's a commodity product at 3% margin. So it just didn't make sense. And, you know, that company, I, I, trip, I, I, I increased their SEO organic uh, visitors by so much. Uh, talking 10 million unique visitors year over year. And, and I'd go into the boardroom and I'd pitch the next big idea and and they wouldn't do it and i was like this is stupid like why am i here and so um i i got so fed up with it i started my first private label brand selling wine and beer glasses with personalized decals and i had a partner at the time uh who figured out how to get these decals uh made out of pewter out of china he was good at logistics uh he sourced some glass out of the dollar tree store like we're talking like classic bootstrap and entrepreneurial stuff right here. And I was the marketing guy. I went in and ran the ads, set up the listings, did all of the back end work. And it was a good partnership for a time. And then at some point, uh, the partnership started to get a little one sided and, and, you know, I wasn't, wasn't getting any money out of the business. And so we parted ways. I immediately started my second personalized, uh, wine glass brand, uh, on my own. And I, in my first year, I made a quarter million dollars in net profit. And my partnership, I only walked away with $37,000 in my pocket. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm not a good partner. I got to do things on my own, right? And when I do things on my own, things work a lot better. And I had the ability to just skyrocket um, doing stuff on my own. One day, uh, working for a lighting company at this point, I get laid off. I, I, I took them from 200K a month to 600K a month on Amazon. And they laid me off a year and a half into the job. I'd moved out from Oklahoma over to Atlanta. Thank God I'm no longer in, in Tornado Alley. Uh, I love the Atlanta hot weather and I'll probably die here. I like Georgia so much. Um, so I'm, I'm up here in North Georgia in the Alpharetta area. And I, uh, 
I got laid off and I, and there was like a 48 hour time period where I'm just like, frick, did I peak? I was making $200,000 salary at 30 years old. Like who the hell wants to hire me for that? And then it dawned on me and I'm like, I'll freaking hire me for that. I'll pay myself that. And so I did. And then I started the agency. Uh, my private label brand kept taking off. My agency did even better than my private label brand. Uh, and I've had way more success on the agency front than I had on running my own private label. Because, you know, as, as you know, and as many people know, running a private label brand requires a huge amount of cash flow. Uh, the logistics and the sourcing and getting up late at night and talking to China. I hated that stuff, right? Like I, I got out of being a TV reporter because I didn't want to be doing live weather hits at 10 o'clock at night. I want to be home in my pajamas. Last thing I want to be doing at 10 o'clock at night is talking to some guy over in China about negotiating two pennies off per unit. So that was what drove me to do what I was doing. Agencies are really great to run because they're just cash heavy businesses. Um, and, and I've, I've been able to build a scalable system and, and, and have some fun with that. That makes sense. So quick question before I move on to the other question out there, Ben, that you have, uh, what do you think contributed to the fact that you guys did $250,000 in first year profits? Cause that's obviously atypical. And also what was the net margin? Yeah. Cause I'm curious what the revenue was. I know yep. today, like you got like a 10, 15% margin if you're lucky. So I was able to buy a personalized wine glass for less than a dollar fifty and sell it between twelve and fifteen dollars. Uh, and so you can back out the FBA fees and you can back out um, all of the logistics and, and advertising costs to, to figure out how I made you know a quarter quarter million doing all that. And it it was successful because I was the first to market at scale um, funny wine glasses. Right. And now nowadays, this business model is pretty dead, not going to lie, because there's too much competition. People aren't willing to spend that much on a single wine glass uh, and tumblers and steel um, have taken over the market and at the same price, but a lower margin. So that's why it did well when it did. Um, but the, the name of the game in products is you have to continuously source new items. Uh, this is especially true in the retail arbitrage world. Uh, and, and I do about eight and a half, nine million dollars uh, a year doing what I like to call uh, retail distribution arbitrage, right? So when people think of arbitrage, they think of like go down to Toys R Us discount and, you know, take some stuff in and out. Um, but when it's on, um, you know, going bankrupt or discounted or postseason, whatnot, but retail distribution arbitrage is finding that except in bulk and buying like eight pallets of the same item. So we've bought tampons, eight pallets worth. We've bought a truckload of tape. We've bought hair regrowth serum, like just all kinds of random products that you would find in you know, household name brands. Um, and I made an 18% margin historically uh, doing retail arbitrage. Uh, distribution arbitrage, as I'm calling it. Uh, nobody else has on the market called it that, by the way. That's just what I think is the best name for it uh, because they're one-off buys. They're not, you can't make this that buy a second time. So it's not wholesale, uh, but it's not retail arbitrage in the sense I'm not physically leaving the building uh, at all. So that was what worked for me. Uh, and, you know, I've had some struggles along the way. You know, last Black Friday, Amazon took away my Tumblr business entirely. Uh, and they said, oh, you cannot use parody uh, in the Tumblr space anymore. So me saying this is the way on a Tumblr, I'm dead in the water. I never had a complaint from Star Wars, but Amazon decided to kill the category. So I've, I've, I've seen all kinds of problems. I've had lots of challenges. I'm looking for my hot sauce bottle on the desk here. And this, this hot sauce bottle I keep on my desk to remind me that like even Amazon experts make mistakes. Uh, I bought a thousand MOQ. I shipped these in. I paid Amazon to do the prep work. This was when I was doing this out of my garage and Amazon puts bubble wrap around it. And then they shipped it out in padded envelopes. And I'm thinking to myself, how is this even possible? This is a five pound glass bottle. It's obviously going to break right? when you ship this out in padded envelopes, talking to seller support, which we all know sucks. Uh, they wouldn't do anything about it. 
they wouldn't ship it in boxes. And so I learned a logistics lesson pretty early on that you have to pre-box everything, do a six foot drop test and stuff like that. So I share my stories like that to help others prevent those same mistakes, saving them thousands of dollars. A few people along the way will pay me to help them even more. And then that makes me wealthy. They make wealth, I make wealth. It's all of us against Amazon. Yeah, of course, of course. So there is a bit of in between between like the wine glass business and the distribution arbitrage that you guys are doing. Uh, and I know this because I follow my Amazon guy and I follow you on LinkedIn. And I know about the hot sauce bottle story, but there is also the uh, age of sage. Did I get that right? Was it age of, age of sage? Yes. Yep. So and my daughter's name is Sage. Yeah. So are there other brands too? Like, can you tell me what brands you launched and I guess what the post-mortem analysis on those are? Because I know you had those uh, soap bars. I was going to mention that. The uh, yes. age, age sticks? Was it called the sage stick? I don't know. Yeah, smudge, smudge sticks or sage oh, sticks. Those both accurate. So so I, I, I one day I wake up and I'm like, you know, what else should I do? And I was thinking to myself, I got five kids, eight and under. Why not make them all a brand? And so the first brand that took off that I was successful with was called Age of Sage. So I put my daughter's face, essentially, uh, you know, in a cartoon style on, on a brand. And I went out and sourced some artisan soaps. And I was trying to think, like, what's my car target demographic? I decided it was like 35-year-old neckbeards, uh, you know, which was a weird target demographic, but they were underserved uh, and they need soap because they smell or something. I don't know. Anyway, the brand did really well. Uh, you know, I, I sold like 300K in artisan soaps in the first year that I launched it. Uh, margins way lower. <laughs> did not make money the first year. Uh, much harder to, to develop a private label from scratch versus just go co-op the demographic. And uh, that was very challenging. You know, there's a steep competition in Dr. Squatch, my number one competitor. Uh, but I found a way to like capture some market share, dabble in it, um, you know, launch some cursory random products outside of soaps like smudge sticks. And, and you know, we had some success. Uh, we also found a lot of challenges along the way. On the smudge stick business, I had hijackers selling their own smudge sticks on my listings. So I was like, frick, got to brand that, update the main image, make sure my logo's on there, make sure the box and package show so that they can't rip me off. Um, at one point, my brand registry got revoked. And, and that, was that was directly related to the Tumblr issue. And uh, I got it back initially for like eight weeks, and then they took it down again. And it's been down for six months now. Uh, and uh, that's, that made me really want to check out of, of selling private label in 2024, not going to lie. So if you're an Amazon seller that's experienced that sort of beatdown, I relate to you. Uh, I know the pain that you're experiencing. Uh, and it's hard to keep going which is why I was like, I gotta, I gotta make something for my kids that they'll inherit 12, 14 years from now. And that was the idea and the intent behind it. Um, but I came to terms with the fact that it didn't have to be a brand that I left them. I, I could make anything for them. Uh, and each kid's gonna want something different. So I've, I, I decided not to move forward with some of the other kid brands that I was making because I, you know, I, I wasn't making a whole lot of money on private label in the last year. In fact, I was losing money, <laughs> especially since I lost a quarter million dollars on the Tumblr business, uh, which ironically wiped out the exact amount of profit that I made in my first year selling the personalized wine glasses. And I was just, I just had a really hard time with that because I, I'm really good at being the guy in the elevator on the way up. I don't know how to manage a business on the way down. That is not how I think or, you know, how I run. Uh, the guy that, uh, you know, from the Discovery Channel that bought HBO or is in charge of HBO now, and they're, they're messing with uh, House of Dragons. And I don't, I don't know if you saw the season finale of House of Dragons or not, but like, holy crap, that was boring AF. Like, there is no fight scene. Nobody died. There was nothing. And, and so I'm thinking to myself, that's the sort of guy that's really good managing business on the way down. And that's not me. I'd be the guy ending on the most expensive battle scene of all time and just an absurd amount of dragon fire. And uh, that's, that's what I would have done if I was in charge of House of Dragons. That's, and, and, and if you know, HBO is listening, you know, give me a ring. But um, I, I am 
know nothing about shrinkage. I know everything about growth and that's where my focus has always been. That makes sense. What's the post-mortem analysis on Age of Sage? Like, do you think if you did things differently, it could have worked out or was it never going to work out with these products? Like, why do you think the brand didn't work out as you envisioned? So, so the products were fine. It's just the hostility of Amazon that's causing the challenge, right? So it went from a $1.2 million brand down to 500K run rates because of the brand registry loss, the Tumblr business loss. Uh, and so I've, I've entrusted my business partner to take over the business. I've stepped away from it. I still have full access to everything. I can still like make videos and play with it, but I'm no longer the pilot. Uh, I've become a silent investor of sorts or silent, you know, watching from the sidelines. Um, and, and so I spend all of my time today focused on the agency. Um, I also opened up the distribution retail arbitrage um, you know, uh, account. And I'm a silent investor on that as well. Uh, and my partner runs everything soup to nuts so that I could, you know, clear the table and focus just on my agency. Because, you know, if you look at my history for the agency and I'll, I, I can share a screen with like our, our historical run rates and I'll, I'll, I'll do that right here. Um, so, all right, share screen, boom, boom, boom. All right, so here you can see 2018, I started the agency on April 2nd uh, off of LinkedIn posts. I had my first contract in 48 hours um, and they're still with me six and a half years later, which is a cool story by itself. And then here's my actual agency revenue, um, you know, historicals. And so uh, I haven't updated the slide I need to. Um, and we we grew really, really fast. And so in the last year, when I'm looking at you know, this million dollar business that I'm no longer making profit on, a la the private label Age of Sage brand versus this $20 million agency behemoth with basically 43% net net profit after I even pay my own salary. It was a no brainer where I should be spending my time. Uh, and so that's really where I've, I've, I've doubled down and, and, and moved over on resources and allocation. Um, but but I shared this as a case study and, and those that want to see the full case study, you can go to myguy.agency slash case and, and check it out. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions on, you know, some key moments or, or what we're doing. Whatever you think is most interesting to your audience is is cool for me to share. That makes sense. I just have a question uh, for myself mostly. I don't know if most Amazon sellers would care, but it looks like the employee to client ratio is changing as you guys grow. So you start out at like 3.3 clients per employee in 2018. And then you had yes. uh, 60 to eight. I don't know what the ratio is. My math isn't good enough. Then you had a four X ratio in 2020. And now it's almost one to one, one employee to one. Uh, so, so today when we update this graphic, you're going to see 548 employees. That's, that's as of like this morning uh, and less than 400 brands. So now it's exceeding that ratio. And, and part of that is because in the first three years, this employee count was almost entirely US based. And as we expanded out internationally, we were able to hire three times the employee headcount for the same rate uh, and we're able to deliver better results for that. So that's why the employee count has surpassed the client count. Um, also, we're able to charge more per client uh, and so that justifies the higher employee count as well. So earlier on, less money per, uh, per client, higher uh, base fees for me to service those. So over time, I've been able to get my costs down, my revenues up, and, and therefore impact the world by hiring or creating more jobs. Uh, and the Filipino labor talent pool, I've, I very much have married myself to that culture. I've, I've held two uh, summits over in the Philippines. I've brought my leaders out from the United States, flying over to the Philippines, uh, building leadership summits and built, you know, all those kinds of things where we had 400 Filipinos in a room, dancing, doing activities, uh, leadership sessions, and me getting on stage and answering questions. They even got me to break dance once against my will, um, you know, <laughs> so uh, good culture building stuff. So that's been really key and fundamental to my success. There is no other agency that has adopted the Filipino talent labor pool as well as us. Uh, and it's been a, a key to our success. A lot of other American based agencies really fail because they don't understand how to integrate it. It's very challenging for them. Um, so that's been a, a moat for me. 
That makes sense. We also hire out of Asia for the most part. Not really the Philippines, but out of India, Pakistan, and some parts of the Middle yeah, East. Yeah, and, and there's great talent pools there as well. Yeah, of course. Um, it's of course. easier to pick one country to focus on. Um, so, you know, for, for those that are agencies out there, uh, my advice is pick one country, go all in on it, um, because it, it will it'll make it easier to integrate everything. Um, there's nothing wrong with diversifying across the world. And we, we're obviously in 11 countries at this point. Um, but, but in terms of having like un, uh, a, a, an ease of use of how to manage the whole system simultaneously, we found it easier to simplify that a bit. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, we're mostly from the, we're mostly from Pakistan in terms of the actual labor force. And I've had success with the guys over there. Yeah, and and, and that is the, Pakistan is the most eager uh, talent pool in the world. Uh, I, I think over the next couple of years, we're going to see great things coming out of Pakistan uh, because of that eagerness. They're just going to, they just have a sheer willpower over there. Um, so it's definitely, definitely a country I'm watching. They've become, you know, one of the, I think second or third most uh, Amazon sellers are coming out of Pakistan as well, which is, you know, a feat of itself. Yeah, exactly. In Pakistan, I don't have the actual numbers on me, so this may or may not be true, but I assume the largest pool of Amazon PPC specialists is in Pakistan, just based on the people I would, that I've I would believe that. Yeah, and even like just the engagement on LinkedIn posts, if you post anything, 90% of them. <laughs> yes, yes. Like so yeah, guys, there's no question that there's the most engagement. No question on that. Yeah. Most of the Americans are keeping to themselves. They don't share their secrets. Pakistan's over there just trying to help the whole country. Exactly, exactly. And I just say like the largest number of PPC specialists are in Pakistan. And I know obviously maybe some of them are just starting out and maybe aren't super good yet, but just like looking at the numbers, if there are 50,000 specialists, no, I'm just like saying yeah, today, it, like if there time. are 50,000 specialists, one or two of them, one to one or two percent of them, three percent of them have to be world class, right? You're not going to have no I believe that. group of 50,000 people. And that's what we do. I interview 300 people and this is besides the applicants we do 300 interviews per person that we hire so yes there's a lot and of people that aren't qualified yet but they're there like good people. that is a very difficult amount of work to hire somebody so so grats on solving that one thing that we did to take down the intensity of the number of interviews we have to conduct is we use software called conductor i'm uh, sorry uh, culture index and it's a two-question survey it takes about five minutes and that knocks out 63% of the pool for us. And we've been able to figure out like, okay, certain personalities do better in certain roles. You wouldn't put an extrovert doing, um, you know, backend Excel work all day long. They'd go crazy, right? So we figure out, okay, this survey says you're an introvert. This survey says you're detail oriented. You'll probably be a good fit for this role. We'll hire you. Other, other roles like sales, we want inpatient, high drive uh, extroverts who can close deals. So we, we, we figured out how to profile per role and it kind of helped us out. So I don't know if you've, you know, ever considered using personality profiling, but it's one thing that's been helpful to us. Yeah. So I do something similar, but a lot of my hiring is outbound. So I don't really, I don't know how the dynamic would work because I'm reaching out to someone. It's awkward. Like, hey, I want you to work with me. And it's like, Hey, fill in this. But take this personality profile first. Yes. It's awkward. Yeah, no question. Exactly. So when people apply we, to AI, although I do give them like a Google form to fill in. But if I'm we do get a other few other awkward things. reviews on Glassdoor from that, no question. Um, but but I'm not going to change my system. I know it works. It's scaled, uh, and we're going to ruffle a few feathers. But I'm okay with that. Yeah, exactly. And I I just pay recruiters at this point, either recruiters or I just have people who do the first interview for me. So everyone who works at my company has to pass through me first. But before that, they go through they go through multiple stages. So we have interviewers basically, and they get paid per interview that they do for me. It's like five to $20 an interview based on the outcome of the actual call. And that just filters like 90% of people. Then I get the last 10%. And if I hire them, I pay the interviewer a bonus. And if I don't hire them, I pay them nothing. And that's been working very well for me. I don't have to take the 300. Wonderful. Myself. That's, yeah. that's a, yeah, I was going to say 300 calls to hire somebody. Whew. So good yeah, job on figuring that out. That's, out. that's a great system. I used to take those myself. My calendar is actually booked because I'm still invited to those calls. I have 20 interviews almost today, I think. So it's pretty hectic. <laughs> wow. So when but, you signed up to to run a business like this, did you know you were going to become an HR company? <laughs> so. it's, it's mostly sales and HR, honestly, and a lot of product development because we do have the yeah. tech aspect as well. But yeah, that's most of my job, uh, interviewing people, 
hiring people, setting up outreach campaigns to hire more people, dealing with the people that we hired, than just closing more deals after that's that's basically my job. But I'm good for you, I'm man. In, yeah, I'm into it. But and now filming videos because I'm doing the content thing too. But uh, yeah, we and, kind of got and, and that's scalable. Yeah, of course, I'm getting good leads out of this. Funny enough, I was just telling my co-founder, uh, once I removed my LinkedIn profile picture, I've been getting 10 times as many leads and just people reaching out for like content. Like, you, I don't know what to make of it. I, I, I have your profile up right now and your picture is blank for me. So I don't yeah, know I, I've what's been going getting on more leads since I removed my face. I don't know what that tells me, but uh, it's that's, a, that's a weird, that's a weird A-B test. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's bad news weird. for me. I don't know. <laughs> But uh, yeah, uh, maybe, we, maybe you need to put up a cartoon shot of yourself or something. Who knows? Maybe your face maybe. was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. But that's but cool. Yeah. That, that that could be part of your brand now. Uh, the the you know be. there's there was this disguised toast. This guy wore a a, a mask while he was streaming, and uh, that's what he became known for. Nobody cared who he was until he put the mask on. So. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's interesting. I wanted to ask you about the um, main causes of failure for Amazon brands. So we take a lot of calls sure. every month. We speak to a ton of different brands and all of them are startup brands because, you know, usually people launch and they're looking for help after that. Once month one happens and they realize it's not working out like they thought they would, they didn't become an overnight Lamborghini driving millionaire. Now they're reaching out asking for oh, help. Oh, baby, sign me up for that. <laughs> Hashtag passive income. <laughs> and a lot of them are on track to fail, honestly. And I tell a lot of them that just because the way that their business is set up, like the type of products that they sell, the margin that they're selling at, the category that they're in, the budget that they have, it just won't work out. So I wanted to ask you and your own experience, because you've had a lot of different ups and downs with Amazon and also just their brands that you work with. What are the most common reasons of failure uh, that people who are either about to launch a brand or in the process of launching a brand can avoid to have a better outcome. So I think you nailed it. I really liked what you said. Um, here's one that I'll add my flavor to, and that is cash flow. Um, we get fired as an agency more often than any other reason is due to cash flow. So when we do our job and we grow the brand, they fire us because they don't have enough money to buy 3x the inventory and keep the agency on staff. And, and they, they know firing us will lead to some sort of uh, you know, backwards decline, but they make a calculated, you know, call on that. And they're like, well, I, I, I got to take a hundred K loan out just to buy this inventory. I, you know, I, I think paying MAGA, you know, a few thousand dollars just doesn't make sense anymore. And I, I totally get it. Um, so that's, that's always, you know, one of the most frustrating things about running an agency is you get fired for doing your job. Uh, you also get fired when you do your job, but the sales don't reflect it, right? Like you, you, you put up the most optimized listing ever. You do your ad job; and it's all perfect, but you're only growing at two or three points a month. And you know, it, it's it's the product. No matter what you do, it's the product, and so you're on track to fail. I liked how you you, you mentioned that. Uh, you're you're either a well-read business book guy, or you came up with that on your own. Either way, it's well articulated. Um, so great, great, great moment on that. Uh, I, I can I can see you now playing that sixty second clip on LinkedIn with the with the testimonial from Pope, but you well earned it, so please do. Uh, but but the uh, the fact of the matter is is when you're a brand, you have to do three things correct. You have to have great finance, good ops, and good marketing. Now you can get C's to get degrees in two of these, as long as the third is an A plus, right? If you get B's in all three, that's even better. But Realistically, most companies are pretty bad at one or two of these. Um, and so like an ideal customer profile for, for my Amazon guy is a brand that's really good at ops. They're an A in ops. Uh, they're a C in marketing. So they hire Mag to get an A in marketing. And then the finance is always the questionable one. It's like, how much do you ask about finance during the, the sales process? I don't really ask too many questions about that, um, which gets me into trouble later. Uh, but but we find that cash flow is the number one killer of Amazon brands. And so we'll, we'll help a brand, we'll do our job, but then they stop paying their bills and they run out of cash. And then we have to fire them if they don't pay their bills or they fire us because they don't want to pay their bills. Um, and so that's, that's what I think a lot of brands just grossly underestimate. Uh, 
when you try and become a real brand, you're no longer uh, side hustling this out of your basement, no longer side hustling this out of your garage. You have to have some serious cash flow, money in the bank to buy product, launch new products, hire people, resources, open up a warehouse potentially. So it's just a lot to invest in. So cash flow would be my answer on that. I think I lost you for a second. But yeah, yeah. We're, might have a connection yeah. issue here, but yeah. Well, yeah, I was going to say, like, even if you did ask out the financials, most brands don't even have the answers. Like, we ask out the numbers, like, I'm asking out the gross profit, the net profit, all of that good stuff. Most of them don't even have the answers. So it's not even worth asking in 95. They don't. Yeah, even it's if I ask it, you're right. Have the numbers. Most of them don't even know what their ad spend their A cost is. And that is a reason of failure. Like every brand that's struggling, and I ask them, like, hey, tell me the numbers so I know why you're struggling. 90% of them don't even know what they're doing revenue wise, profit wise, ad spend wise, A cost wise, tackles wise. And then they're asking why they're struggling. Like, of course, they're struggling. That's, that's why during my sales process, we stopped asking those number questions <laughs> and, and, and we just do front end audits. And it's, that's kind of how I, I, I tackle that. Cause you're totally right, man. Like the, these, these Amazon brand owners are, are new to the game, right? They haven't been doing this 30 years. They've, they've been doing it two or three years on average. Uh, they're native born Amazon brands. They've never been to retail. They don't know what they don't know. Um, they watched a few YouTube videos, maybe uh, had a good product idea and, you know, maybe got it to 30, 40,000 a month, but are wondering how to get it to a million. Um, so that's where, you know, marketing companies like, like Mag and like you come in and, and help out. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you mentioned earlier about the uh, retail, was it distribution arbitrage? Is that what you call yes, it? Yes, you got it. Okay. And yes. I am interested in that personally. Uh, you mentioned before the call, you guys did $9 million of revenue uh, off of this business model. And you kind of explained earlier how it works with you guys buying the pallets and everything. But I'm actually curious how the business works, like in detail, like where are you sourcing these deals from? Because um, I, as far as I'm aware, they're not available online. There's no like Alibaba for pallets of unsold products that could do on Amazon. How do you qualify these deals? What do you know what to buy and what to not buy? You know, what products are done and which product could potentially sell on Amazon. So give us the actual details of how this works. So there's, there's a lot of ways this does work. So I'll just give you one. Um, so you have to get, on these email lists for auction based liquidation events. And then you have to be the first to say, I'll take it, commit and pay for it same day. So that means you have to have a freaking ton of cash on hand. And then, and then you, you flip it in Amazon. So there's obviously a lot of due diligence you got to do. You got to check the listing. Can you load it to your product? Is it a gated category? Uh, a lot of challenges that happen along the way. Uh, I would say 8% of what you buy minimum will just be dead in the water stock uh, that you just suck it up and send it out for Christmas gifts that year. Hey, Steven, you sent me 10 scissors for Christmas. Thanks, I think, right? Like those are the sort of things that can start happening. Otherwise you throw it in a dumpster. I mean, what else do you do? Um, and, and so just, this is not a good business model for most people. Uh, it's a great business model for people who are have two things. One, a crap ton of t cash. And two, that are really good at making deals or sourcing. Um, and so I'm not good at the second one. I'm, I'm just the cash guy. And so my partner is the one that's good at deal making uh, and, and distribution. And so um, there's, there's obviously like seven other ways that distribution arbitrage can be done. Um, but I'm delineating it or separating it out in the fact that we're not going to physical buildings and, and, and looking at inventory. Usually uh, it's all digitally distributed and we're going to larger distributors who have massive warehouses, liquidation events. You know, maybe they have a client that hired them to store some stuff and it's been two years since they paid their bills. And so the contract says, you know, they take ownership of the product and the warehouse doesn't want to go sell it on Amazon. That's not their business. Their business is warehousing. So they'll, they'll put it up for auction and you can pick it up. So things like that, um, it, it's, it's a high cash business, high sourcing. Uh, there is no marketing involved. Like you're not running PPC. You're not optimizing a listing. Uh, it is straight up go source items for the lowest margin, lowest cost, rather highest margin uh, and flip them. That makes sense. And we're going in and out with the connection. Maybe it's just me. So I'm going to wrap up with one final question. 
Uh, if you were 22 years old today and you just graduated from college and you wanted to start a business, what would Stephen Pope do? So I would probably go take a job at 22 uh, because at 22, you don't have cash flow. And so getting into private label at 22, like you, you, you're you like 80% of the 22 year olds that try and pull this off are going to fail and they're just going to waste five, $10,000 of whatever cash they have. Um, there's 20% of 22 year olds that will probably pull it off uh, and they'll roll it over. But I think predominantly, I think at age 22, you should go work for a company. Maybe it's my Amazon guy. Maybe it's another agency where you learn all of these technical things. You learn how to, how to freaking source products, but also ship it in so you don't make a hot sauce, uh, you know, glass mistake. You need to understand what you can and can't do on Amazon. You need to understand uh, the hostility of the Amazon platform. And so you need, you need to have that experience. Um, if you don't be prepared to pay your taxes, right? The Amazon tax is paid in thousands of dollars in mistakes thousands of dollars in wasted product, dead in the water. Uh, and so I, I don't think it, most 22 year olds can stomach those outcomes uh, and they just need to be able to pay rent and whatnot. So I, I think most people should go get a job. Now, there are some 22 year olds that are so programmed entrepreneurial that they could sell mud uh, to anybody. They could sell ice to Eskimos. And for those guys, Maybe you should start on your own and, and, and you know, renege on, on what I'm saying here, but just go straight in and go do it because you're good at that. Um, you're a trailblazer. Uh, and for those high, high drive, inpatient guys who aren't afraid to lose, go, it, go for it by all means. Um, but, but there's just so many things that are going to happen along your journey. Just be prepared for thousands of dollars in mistakes. Uh, and you're going to have to watch a lot of YouTube videos and good luck figuring out which ones are pertinent. Uh, and how to find good information. Cause you know, watching a SEO video from Neil Patel about Amazon probably ain't going to help you. That dude doesn't know anything about Amazon, uh, That's true. but you might think he does. Cause he knows something about website SEO, right? So like stuff like that, you just have to pick up and understand and, and find your people and, and join the right groups. But there's just a lot of lost souls in our space asking a lot of questions. Seller support sucks. They're not going to help you. Uh, you know, your competitors obviously want you to fail so that they have more room for them. You're going to be attacked by the Chinese hijackers. You're going to going to be yanked listings for random things. You have no idea why. And, and, and all of these things are going to happen. And then you'll try and source something out of China. And then the Chinese will put Chineseium in instead of iron. Uh, and your product will be terrible, right? Like all of these things can happen. This is what it's like to be an Amazon seller. It's the truth. Um, so it's not hashtag passive income. Um, so I would say get some real experiences, side hustle, Amazon, don't make it your main hu hustle at age 22. That makes sense. And what if you weren't married to the Amazon business? Like you could, you're free to start anything. Would you still start something at 22 or would you just go get a job? What, whatever you want to start a business in, go work for somebody who's really good at it. Learn their trade, learn their craft. And, and, and it's okay to be upfront and be like, Hey, in two years time, I want to go start my own thing. And tell them. So if you if you want to be a plumber, go go look at how to be the best plumber ever. Be an apprentice. Go work for somebody for free if you have to to get the experience. Um, Alex Ramosi talks a lot about that. Um, so so I would say you if you're a lost twenty two year old, you don't know what to do, just get a job. But if you know you want to be a business owner, then go work for the best business owner in your network and tell them what your plans are and and ask them to teach you everything they know and bend over backwards to give them the best work you've ever done in your life do it for free initially if you have to to get your foot in the door but go get that experience because those those things are going to teach you you don't just open up a blacksmith shop one day because you you think that's cool you got to go apprentice and understand how to meld and welds and 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 understand how embers work and what temperature to put the the iron in at and how to pour it and what equipment to, to buy. And, and there's just a lot there. You can't just read that in a book. So I, I think apprenticing at 22 is the, the most smartest thing that you can do. Uh, best thing you can do far none. That makes sense. Well, thank you so much. That's it for my question. So I appreciate you coming on and I'm excited to Thanks for having me on. One of the best ones we've done. Thank you so much. And I'll see you guys again soon. Have a great day. Grateful to have you.